so with that, um, I would like to um, transition over to Julie Lin Wong um, to tell us about um, you know, her work with um, 3D4MD. And, um, and yeah, here we go, Julie Lin, it's all yours. Oh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. There okay, you go. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm a board certified public health um, and aerospace medicine physician, scientist, innovator, and educator. And my career has really been focused on pushing uh, 3D printing technology to the extreme to benefit humanity. And um, something that's important to uh, take note of is that um, so 3D printers have actually been around for over 30 years. So uh, the big question is, why are there 3D printers in every hospital and clinic? And so there are a number of reasons why, actually. So most commercial 3D printers designed for healthcare systems are very um, big, they're very expensive, and uh, typically they also use very, very uh, pricey proprietary filament uh, materials. There was actually a report uh, co-authored by Stanford radiologists a few years ago that projected that it would take your healthcare facility at least 10 years to pay off uh, one of these uh, 3D printing uh, machines. As well, um, these uh, medical 3D printers typically uh, require very, very highly skilled technicians to operate and maintain. And uh, the vast majority of um, healthcare applications of 3D printing have been focused on um, medical models. And what I mean by that, are those are um, 3D printed uh, uh, items that are uh, typically based on uh, the human body. So whether it's taking digital imaging and converting it into a, uh, you know, 3D printed anatomy model, or um, as uh, a prior um, uh, presentation showed, uh, you know, modeling a, a 3D printed cast off of uh, somebody's arm. And so these organic shapes um, actually uh, quite often uh, require uh, a lot of what we call post-processing. So that may be removal of uh, support or raft material. Um, and uh, this, um, any post-processing with 3D printing will dry, significantly drive up the production time and cost. As well, right now, um, uh, the most likely benefits of 3D printing are for uh, complex, high stakes, rare uh, operations, like, like reconstructive procedures. And um, so um, what that means is that um, those types of applications are suitable for tertiary level academic medical centers, but really not appropriate for your average community hospital. So um, this is a collection of, of what I consider to be beautiful works of uh, 3D printed art. These are medical models. They're uh, based off of um, digital imaging and they are made on a, a commercial 3D printer that uh, costs nearly half a million dollars. It took a large team of uh, very uh, highly educated uh, technicians to make these models. And like great works of art, um, these models are a luxury. They are not affordable, accessible, or beneficial for patients in the most challenging places and for those who need it the most. So the question um, I was asking was, well, why should we be spending valuable, finite resources to create solutions to make the wealthiest, healthiest people uh, a little bit better? So I'm a public health doctor. I believe that we should use 3D printers to deliver better health care um, in the most challenging places to those who need it the most. So I founded 3 d from d a social enterprise that makes 3D printable medical supplies for over a billion patients at home, abroad, and in space. And uh, some of the, uh, the challenges of uh, humanitarian medical applications of 3D printing um, include a lack of um, 3D printing equipment that's suitable for off-grid and offline use uh, by non-experts. Remember that there are over 1 billion people who lack access to electricity and nearly 4 billion people who don't have access to the internet. Um, and as well, uh, 3D uh, print files, the ones that are available in open source online digital repositories, often lack uh, quality uh, control. Um, there's no clinical oversight. Uh, you don't have any secure storage of patient match devices. And uh, most of the designs are not very user friendly. So one of the reasons why we've chosen to focus on um, desktop 3D printers is because, uh, well, first of all, uh, they're very uh, portable. You can carry them, I take them with you um, to places. Um, they're very uh, affordable. Um, and um, most of these desktop 3D printers, or many of them, are what we call an open filament system, which also helps uh, to keep the uh, material costs low. 
as well, because they're designed for consumers, they're a lot more user friendly than the commercial um, 3D printers that are sold to healthcare facilities. Um, the fact that the 3D printer allows you to make uh, what we call patient match devices um, that are uh, customized for not just the patient's um, you know, uh, physical dimensions, but also their personal preferences as well. Um, having a 3D printer is like having a little uh, mini factory or robot that makes whatever you tell it to, to make. So it's labor saving, which is one of the uh, biggest uh, cost drivers in healthcare. And in doing so, by being labor saving, of course, um, a 3D printer is a cost saving as well. And, um, you know, there are biodegradable and recycled plastic filaments that you can use the 3D print with. And uh, you can use renewable energy sources like uh, solar energy to power 3D printers. So it can be a very sustainable uh, technology. So with 3D printing, remember, physical objects can be stored as digital files. And this allows us to crowdsource and store uh, innovative uh, designs on an unprecedented global scale. So what you guys are seeing here is actually the first hardware that was uh, 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 uplinked to space. Normally, if we want to send uh, tools or medical supplies to the space station, we actually have to put in a rocket, blast it up, and, and, uh, and, and, and send it up there. But now, um, you can just create files on Earth and then just electronically transmit those files uh, to your spacecraft and, um, and have them printed um, on site uh, locally. So um, given these, uh, the challenges I described earlier with uh, the humanitarian applications of 3D printing, uh, my social enterprise, uh, we have been uh, building a secure desktop 3D printing system that now meets Health Canada and United States Food and Drug Administration guidelines for 3D printed medical devices and cybersecurity. Um, as well, um, this uh, system contains a, a number of crowdsourced, quality tested uh, medical, surgical, and assistive devices that can be made on demand locally. And as well, uh, most importantly, it can be um, used uh, offline and off grid uh, by uh, minimally trained personnel. So I'm going to go through a few case studies. Uh, first one here is, of course, astronauts. We know that they uh, can't take everything they need with them on long space missions. And what is happening right now is that they are either bringing files or files will be transmitted to them. And so they can 3D print not just medical supplies, but uh, tools, uh, spare parts, and even habitats on demand locally. So uh, last year, um, we 3D printed the first medical supplies off Earth on board the International Space Station. Uh, we showed it was possible to take a laser hand scan archive from the space suit gloves um, fitting process and uh, use free software uh, to make a uh, uh, a custom uh, fitted uh, finger splint uh, to treat an injured astronaut and uh, and you could use that uh, or do that using a uh, solar powered Star Trek replicator. And so as well we've also made uh, surgical instruments if we had to uh, operate on a astronaut on a Mars mission. Uh, the benefit of this is uh, it could also benefit uh, uh, the surgical tools could also uh, be life-saving for the five billion people who are here on earth who lack access to safe, timely, and affordable surgical care. As well as I mentioned earlier, there's over a billion people who don't have access to electricity. The uh, space station, oh sorry, so we, uh, uh, we built and uh, tested a solar powered um, ultra portable 3D printing system, it's plug and play, um, and it fits inside a, a carry-on suitcase. And uh, you can use it to make uh, functional medical supplies, which we had tested in clinics. And the benefit of having this, uh, what we call a, a, a suitcase solar powered 3D printer, is that it, um, uh, uh, you can take it on as, as, a, as carry on luggage. So, uh, first of all, it, it kind of protects the printer because um, you're not checking it in. So, you know, you're not going to have the uh, delicate components of the printer potentially damaged. Um, but as well, um, you save money on check baggage fees. So, nearly half of the world's population um, lives in rural or remote areas. And um, that's uh, nearly 4 billion patients. And um, these uh, patients often um, uh, face uh, huge healthcare gaps and disparities uh, simply because of their geographic location. Uh, so we have been um, uh, working um, on a number of different projects where we 3D print um, uh, medical supplies um, uh, for uh, patients in uh, remote areas um, who also have uh, specialty uh, healthcare support uh, through uh, some sort of telemedicine platform. So here's an example. This is uh, a uh, custom uh, made 
uh, mallet finger splint, which is uh, used to treat a very common uh, hand injury called a mallet finger. And this uh, injury, if it's not properly treated, you can actually develop permanent crippling hand deformities. And so the problem is, is that um, you need a specialized hand therapist, um, of which there are a small number uh, worldwide. Entire countries on this planet actually don't have hand therapists or their specialized equipment. And so, um, so what we were able to show is that you could actually uh, take some pictures of an injured patient's hand and uh, uh, derive soft tissue measurements from it and uh, put it into free software and generate a custom fitted mallet finger splint um, and, uh, and use it on an actual patient. And we actually did a little cost analysis and found out that the uh, material um, uh, costs uh, about half uh, the 3D printer filament uh, used to make this splint was about half the price of the, um, uh, the, uh, the white splint making material that I showed you earlier. And as well, just for fun, we also took that same file and then we uh, 3D printed that splint um, out of a filament that contains 25% recycled plastic drink bottles. So uh, nearly 1 billion people, that's one in seven people on this planet have a disability. And many people with disabilities um, need but can't get assistive devices that allow them to participate fully in everyday life. Um, we make award-winning 3D printed assistive devices um, that can be made on 3D printers um, in public libraries, uh, schools, universities, and people's homes. Um, the goal is to save time and money for people with disabilities. And so um, this, of course, is a, a very famous open source design of a 3D printed prosthetic hand. We've made them for uh, two female uh, pediatric patients here in Canada um, who um, have uh, congenital hand anomalies. Um, the hand you see on the right, uh, that was actually made for a, uh, um, a little girl whose uh, family has um, immigrated from the Sudan. Um, having a physical difference is very stigmatizing in her, um, uh, in her native culture. So she asked us to uh, 3D print her a hand uh, that not only fit her, um, her uh, residual limb, but also um, matched her skin tone. So with 3D printing, um, it's very easy, of course, to um, pick different uh, colors uh, to suit the patient's uh, personal preferences. So as well, this is uh, an example of custom fitted finger splints we made for a, a Canadian woman with cerebral palsy. Uh, she has to wear splints and also fingers of her right hand in order to allow her fingers to function, but as well to keep her swan neck deformities from getting worse. And so uh, we, um, uh, her actual hand therapist came to us uh, and uh, asked us uh, to, to assist her. And so we took some measurements of her fingers. And now this patient has a digital file. So anytime she needs a new splint, um, instead of normally researching um, hand therapist, booking an appointment, waiting for that appointment, and then having to, uh, you know, travel to an appointment, potentially miss work, and then pay that hand therapist for their labor time and material costs. Now the patient has a digital file. Anytime she needs a new splint, she can just go to the public library, pick the color she wants, and have another splint printed for less than $2 and not have to miss work. So as well, um, we're very much proponents of user-centered design. We've interviewed a number of multiple sclerosis patients who uh, require the use of wheelchairs or scooters, and they have told us um, that uh, they uh, would really like a cup holder that attaches to their wheelchair. Um, so we designed a, a 3D printable cup holder um, that uh, is 100% 3D printed. You can print it at the public library. So even the screws that you can see, they're 100% 3D printed. But one of the key uh, design issues here is that wheelchairs don't come in any standard shape or size. So on some wheelchairs, you may attach your cup holder to the vertical uh, part of the arm, which is um, uh, what you see there on the left. But on other um, wheelchairs, you may actually attach the cup holder to the horizontal part of the arm. So we designed our, our cup holder um, to be what we call universally ac uh, accessible um, and, and designed to fit any wheelchair design. As well, there's uh, over 250 million people worldwide who have diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of older people um, generally. And uh, uh, one of the issues is that as you age, uh, you also uh, are just uh, have a higher probability of developing other core morbid medical conditions. Some of those medical conditions like arthritis or stroke could actually impair your ability uh, 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 to use your hands, particularly your fine motor skills. And so imagine if you're a diabetic patient and you have arthritis and you can no longer uh, give yourself your uh, own insulin injections. Well, then our healthcare system has to uh, basically send a home care nurse to your home twice a day to give you your insulin injections. This is uh, very devastating to a patient because it uh, significantly uh, reduces their quality of life because they are forced to sit at home and wait for the nurse to show up twice a day. And so a very, very simple assistive device like this one that can be 3D printed for less than a dollar at the public library is a little syringe handle grip that you can put over an insulin syringe and permit a patient with limited use of their hands to continue self-injections and not require home nursing care. 
So uh, one of my favorite uh, projects is uh, 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 making 3D printed um, objects for uh, the over 135 million people who require humanitarian uh, assistance. We have a number of projects underway. So one of the key things to remember is that um, in a humanitarian crisis, uh, supply uh, chains are fragile, they're very expensive, and they're time consuming. And so uh, getting things to places, uh, medical supplies, uh, can be a huge challenge, uh, despite the amount, uh, the, the millions and billions of dollars that are poured into humanitarian aid. So we are working on a number of different projects with big and small um, NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, but as well uh, uh, small nonprofits. Uh, to try and use 3D printing to deliver better healthcare in humanitarian settings. Here's an example. Um, so, uh, you know, the thing about 3D printing, what it's really taught me is to, uh, it's taught me humility, but as well, it's taught me to respect simple devices. So, um, as a resident, I never paid attention to suction canisters, but when you think about it, if a suction canister doesn't work, a surgeon or a dentist uh, simply uh, can't do their job or, or a nurse. And so, um, and, um, in places like Ghana, um, because the uh, per medical procurement system um, is, is not robust um, and um, the, um, the Ghanan hospitals um, are um, actually have to reuse their suction canisters. Normally, um, we use them once and we throw them away. Um, so uh, they may wait um, up to you know, months, um, even years to have these canisters replaced. So what they do is they end up uh, washing out those suction canisters um, after each procedure and uh, with a bleach solution and reusing it. The problem is, is because suction canisters are under uh, significant negative pressure, if you're not careful when you remove um, the uh, top of the canister, you can actually crack the lip, which is what you see in the left panel there. Um, once that lip is cracked, um, that suction canister is no longer usable and you may not know when you're gonna get the next one. So um, we've been uh, coming up with different designs and uh, one prototype is what you see in the right there. So that red um, O-shaped ring, um, is 3D printed out of flexible material um, on a desktop 3D printer that you can find in the public library. And the, the goal of this fix is to uh, cover up um, a, a cracked lip and potentially take a broken piece of medical equipment and make it functional again. So as well, um, we've been working with other great humanitarian uh, medical aid organizations, uh, one's based in the Gaza Strip, and uh, we work with them to prototype a 3D printed life-saving tourniquet um, the Gaza Strip has a supply blockade, and uh, they are unable to obtain uh, tourniquets. And so um, these 3D printed tourniquets have been deployed and, and been used to save lives um, in Gaza. As well, um, the uh, uh, UNICEF actually uh, deployed what, what they call these early childhood development kits uh, to, um, uh, to kids in, in conflict zones or, or in, in disaster areas. And um, we've been looking at this kit and seeing if we can uh, make a lower cost version of it and uh, even better, um, actually printing um, kit items out of biodegradable plastic. So um, what ended up happening um, after uh, the work that I started doing a few years back is I had a number uh, of very keen, innovative individuals um, all over the world approaching me asking how they could get um, involved. Uh, with using 3D printing for social good. So about a year and a half ago, I founded Medical Makers, um, and that's a global community of um, nearly 200 uh, innovators, uh, healthcare providers, and patients um, in uh, 10 countries. And um, uh, we teach them 3D printing as well as other technology skills, and they work on projects uh, for social good and give back to our local and global community. Um, actually, 50% of Medical Makers are girls and women, don't let this uh, photo fool you. Um, and uh, actually, one of our medical makers there on the left, uh, her name is Jody. Jody um, started uh, joined medical makers when she was 16. We ended up listing her as a co-inventor in seven pending patents. And uh, she just finished her first year at Johns Hopkins University uh, studying biomedical engineering on a full scholarship. Uh, here's an example of a project we actually had Jody work on. Um, this is a uh, the gold standard device for uh, measuring static and dynamic two-point discrimination. And uh, it was uh, actually uh, co-invented by two hand surgeons. The problem is, is that uh, uh, most of us in healthcare do not use this device because it's too expensive. And if you lose it, it's very costly to replace. So in fact, this is the cheap and convenient uh, solution that most of us use in healthcare. It's a, it's a paper clip um, that uh, we've sort of converted into sort of like a tweezer-like device. And uh, so I spoke with Jody, who had taught herself uh, to uh, make 3D models using free software. and um, Jody ended up designing a, a 3D printed a two point discriminator uh, that's shaped like a ninja star that also functions like a fidget spinner. 
um, is uh, in multiple languages, as you see here, and is much more accurate than a paperclip and uh, much cheaper than the gold standard device. So um, we're hosting medical makeathons um, around the globe. Um, we believe anybody can be an innovator, so anybody can attend a makeathon. Um, we teach you tech skills, and you work on um, uh, solving problems for uh, global health challenges. And in doing so, we add more 3D printable designs to our digital archive to benefit humanity. And so, yeah, so here's an example of one of our uh, makeathons that we hosted last spring. Um, but so the key thing with 3D printing, um, I want you all to remember is that um, with this technology, anybody can be an innovator. Um, you can teach yourself how to use uh, 3D design software um, uh, for free. And, um, uh, and there are many programs that are free that you can use. 3D printers are very, very accessible, particularly the desktop ones. You don't have to buy one. Um, they're in your public libraries, in your schools, in your universities. Um, and as well, the 3D printing filament for these desktop printers is usually uh, very, very inexpensive. So yeah, so um, I hope uh, you'll consider getting involved, uh, whether it's through sponsoring a little me a medical makeathon um, at your uh, healthcare facility, you're suggesting um, designs that would be useful for patients or healthcare providers, starting a local medical makers chapter, or even purchasing one of our medical maker lab kits. So, um, so in closing, I just want to say to all of you that um, I hope you all live long, and prosper. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Julian. Wow. You just, I, I, my mind is blown. Um, this is incredible, incredible work that you're doing and the impact you're having on, on lives um, is, is just beyond, um, I'm sort of at a, at a loss of words at this point. Um, I, I know we're coming up at the top of the hour, um, and, and so we only have a couple of minutes for questions. There's one that is, um, burning um, here in the chat um, log here. People are wondering how do you, for, for the prosthetics um, that you had mentioned, how do you mitigate legal risk with using a 3D printed um, prosthetic that is not FDA cleared? Or is that something that have to be cleared through the FDA? So I'm actually glad that uh, you asked that question actually, because I have very uh, uh, strongly uh, sort of firm views on how 3D printed prosthetics should be utilized in healthcare. So, um, so the reality is, is that actually um, there is still uh, no, um, or there's an absence of data to show that 3D printed prosthetic hands um, are um, in the long term accepted, um, that they're durable, um, and they don't cause any potential complications uh, for patients. And so um, the way, um, the approach that we've taken with 3D printed prosthetics um, is that we highly discourage the use of, um, or, or the, um, uh, what we call handathons, which are either uh, the local or uh, remote uh, making of um, a number of uh, prosthetic hands um, for patients. And the reason why is because there's no clinical oversight. Um, and uh, so, um, so I think the way to approach 3D printed prosthetics in healthcare is to ensure that that patient is first evaluated in the healthcare setting. Um, and we've actually started a program to do this. So if you're interested, please come and uh, reach out to me. Um, and, um, and to make sure that that healthcare provider um, is using some sort of validated um, survey questionnaire. So there's you know, certain aspects you wanna be monitoring on the physical exam, as well as um, you know, identifying what are the functional issues that patient is facing. And then um, uh, what we do is that uh, we actually provide that 3D printed prosthetic device um, to the patient, but only in the healthcare setting. So uh, that little girl um, who wanted that uh, skin tone matched uh, prosthetic, she received that in her physician's office. And, uh, and we actually uh, then follow up with the physician and make sure that she's not developing any complications. In fact, actually, she has outgrown her last one, so she wants a new one. Um, and uh, that goes in a database for eventual publication. So I think that's the right way to do it. Um, 3D printed prosthetics fall under a um, sort of an interesting clause um, in, uh, when it comes to FDA regulation. In general, uh, because they are sort of these custom one-offs, um, you can print uh, a certain number, and, and you'll have to actually go to the FDA website and look it up. I, I can't remember what the number is. I think it's five or ten, and um, and it's provided um, that it's it's a limited number. Um, then you don't actually fall under the uh, 
uh, the FDA purview for uh, for three D printed medical devices. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. If people are interested in following up with you with questions, what is the best way for them to to reach you? Is it to go through DD three D four MD website? Oh yeah, yeah. So we have a website and there's a contact page and uh, yeah, send an email and uh, it'll get to me. Great. Thank you so much.